Okay, so I just wanted to um, finish a couple of slides from yesterday, and then there was also something yesterday I didn't do, which I need for introduction today, and then I'll start today's talk. So, <clears throat> just wanted to give you um, where, where are we, this is stuff from yesterday, where we are headed. And so our goal really is to um, develop eventually a theory that kind of can take all this data together and the way we approach this is slightly different because we want to try to come up with a, with a theory that explains the phenomenology of the network from a, um, from a uh, first principles approach and not just by purely taking all the data and fitting all the means and adjusting 38 different parameters or so. And so um, for this essentially you need to have a, uh, need to have an anchor and um, our anchor tries to find, basically tries to work with realistic constraints um, for these biochemical signaling uh, networks and then you, and, and those are based on first principles. And um, what we basically um, want to achieve is that if you have a, uh, an input like the transcription factors or the positions, the ligands or whatnot into your, into your network, that we want to use those and then maximize the transmission of information in the sense of Shannon. The information can be um, defined very rigorously mathematically. It's, uh, it's based on you know, the same kinds of probability distributions that I showed you yesterday. Um, and so, and we had already, as I alluded to yesterday, um, there are signatures in our data that let us believe that that information is optimized in our system. So there's a transmission that goes from those broad gradients that contain positional information after the setup of the mother, that that information is passed on to the different layers of the network in an optimal manner. And so that is kind of the principle that we would like to, to put behind our, our, our network. Um, and then under that constraint to basically um, optimize, um, uh, sorry, and, and optimize the parameters under the constraints that eventually the number of signaling molecules is finite. And that, of course, leads to biochemical noise, and you then need to uh, look at how do you deal with uh, the noise in gene expression in your system. And so just very briefly, the key ideas for this theory are then to, um, because we want to characterize not just the means but also the covariance metrics because we have access to that in our data, you need, you need, of course, to understand the biophysical constraints that encompass noise uh, in gene regulation. And so you need a mo noise model. And we are testing several ones. And we are trying to have them as realistic as possible, but also as, um, as rich as possible so that we have a lot of flexibility. And that goes also for the, um, the, uh, the gene regulation dynamics, for which we also have a, a, a rich set of of, um, of parameters that allow us to um, eventually then have in, in enough parameters to fit the model, but also not too many so that you get, you get to overfitting. But the fact is that because we eventually um, want to recover not just the means, but also the covariance metrics, we have a much richer set of data that we, that we can use to constrain our parameters. And so in, in eventually, this is then all optimized um, by, basic, by maximizing this objective function, which is maximizing um, the transmission of positional information. And that is a number that has a unit. It's in bits. So you can actually have a real measure for how good you're, you're, you're doing in the end, and then compare that to how much information is inherent in your, in your model. So this. When you talk about first principles, the first principle is really the, to understand the, uh, the molecular, I mean, the, the, Well, so what is different is that we don't fit these. Um, we don't have. Um, a, a, we don't fit what the uh, what the model spits out as profiles. We don't fit that directly to our means or something, and use that to adjust a connectivity matrix or so. What we want is to set up the system and have it with 
with plausible parameters, so few fewer parameters, as few as possible, that most of them we hopefully have, have measured, um, to give us candidates uh, that you know, spit out profiles that resemble what we have right now. And uh, eventually then that will be based on optimizing the, in the, in the transmission of information, which is a much larger principle than you, know, you, set, you write down a set of differential equations for each of your player and, and fit those to your mean. Okay. Well, this is, all a, this is all a bit abstract. I don't want to talk too much about this today. Um, so the, this is work that has been going on for the last almost 10 years with our collaborators in Vienna, uh, Gaspar Tachik, and in Princeton, uh, Bill Bialek, and in Paris with Alexander Walchak. And um, one person who is right now at the, at the core of uh, the continuation is uh, Thomas Sokolowski, who sits in the audience, and he has a poster tomorrow. And I'm sure he is happy to uh, tell you much more of the details um, of how we are proceeding there. All right. I want to really continue, go on to talking about transcription regulation today. So now let's switch gears uh, and uh, think back what I talked about yesterday. Um, I, kind of, I told you that um, the fly system seems to be extremely precise and reproducible to the level of you know, the, the utmost extent that it could be to the level of individual cells. And so there's no need for the system to be any more reproducible or precise than that. And that is a network that is based on transcription, so transcription networks, all players are transcription factors. But transcription is inherently noisy. At least we know that from single-celled organisms. And so um, I alluded to it yesterday, we wanted to check whether um, there's something special about transcription development that makes the system as precise as uh, we see in our data. Okay? And so we developed a system to look at this uh, in, in, in vivo. And so um, here I'm looking at the transition again from this broad input gradient, this exponential gradient, how it switches on this, um, this uh, step-like function where at the center of the embryo, it splits the embryo in half and shows you an on and off, on off transition, if you want. And so um, we um, developed a, a, a method with which you um, can basically measure the activity of transcription uh, in vivo. And the way this works is that essentially you have a, um, you can make a reporter for this gene. This gene is called hunchback, and you can take the regulatory sequences of this hunchback and fuse to it a um, little reporter at the, at the five prime end of, of the promoter. And now whenever a polymerase goes by this reporter, it attaches a little stem loop or cassette of stem loops to the unfinished piece of mRNA. Okay, these stem loops, they're called MS2. They are... There's just a small you know, 1 kb uh, sequence that basically gives you 24 of those stem loops. They're now dangling on your elongating polymerase. OK? Oh, something didn't work when I redid this talk. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah? Sorry? Yeah, so how is it, how does it become a reporter, exactly? What is the what? Yeah, so what, yeah, exactly, right, because I haven't, I, I, have, I haven't finished. So what is reported is that these stem loops now, they can, they are recognized by a protein. That's the recognition protein for those stem loops. Both come from a bacterial system, so bacteria make these things naturally. They have a, an mRNA stem loop that they just generate, and there's a protein that happens to bind, that happens to recognize that stem loop. Now you can take that protein, fuse it to GFP, and provide it in the mother. And so now what happens is that this protein will bind to those stem loops, it has GFP attached to it. And now each polymerase gives you then one digit of fluorescence more on your site in the genome where you're making this gene. 
And here in this movie, you see, so yesterday I showed you a movie. Yesterday it was white, so now it's red. So in red, you see those, the DNA again. This was histone GFP. In this case, it's histone RFP. It's the same movie than yesterday, just with a different color. And in red, you see these nuclei. They divide, etc. It's just a zoom in from what I showed you yesterday. It's not the entire embryo. But now, in each nucleus, you discover there are two green spots. And those green spots correspond to the two transcription sites. Because flies are diploid, they have a piece of DNA, or they have a chromosome from the mother and from the father, you see two of them. Okay? And so what you can do now is you can take the intensity of this, um, can take the, uh, you can go in and ask what is the intensity as a function of time of these spots. Okay? And so if you take um, that one hour window that I looked at yesterday with the gap genes, and you are, this is after, after the last division has happened, what happens to the uh, intensity? Well, it comes out of mitosis and increases, and then it fluctuates. Okay, and those fluctuations, they are, um, they can be, uh, they show you that, you know, there is noise in transcription. There are bursts, however you want to call them. And so there's nothing really special about transcription in the fly system, the fly just has found a way to cope with the noise. Okay? Is there any question about this? I think you're going to use this system for quite a bit. And so the, um, the advantage of this system is if you were to measure, how do you measure? Yesterday we measured gene expression by looking at the protein output in a dead animal. Okay? So why don't I look at the protein output of a living animal? I could just put GFP to the protein that is made. But the problem, if you do that, is that the GFP takes a while to actually become bright. Okay, it's called uh, maturation or folding time of the protein. And so if you measured the protein output, you would have a time delay of like 10, 15 minutes, which you can't afford in a system that runs as fast as the Tosophila embryo. Okay? However, in this system here, that's not the case. Because the protein that's fused to this, the GFP that's fused to that stem loop binding protein has been provided by the mother during oogenesis, during she made the embryo, and she just, like the histone yesterday, she just put that in the embryo and it was ready to go. And now whenever you have a stem loop system that gets generated zygotically after MBT, like after two hours, those proteins are ready, they're all going to bind to these stem loops and that increases your signal-to-noise ratio at the stem loop because now you concentrate those GFPs that are floating around all at that stem loop place. Is, this, is that clear? Yeah? Sorry? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Yeah, so first of all, what about binding? <laughs> the, uh, the binding affinity is super high. And it st just stays stuck. It's almost like a covalent bond. You need a lot of KT to get rid of, the, to get rid of that stem loop protein combination. And that has been, we have measured it. I mean, not we, but collaborators. Yeah? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, first of all, how do I want to go into this? Yeah, so each cassette, each of these, each polymerase has a cassette of 24 stem loops, but each stem loop can bind two GFPs. Okay, so that's 48 per polymerase. Okay, and now you can then count how many polymerase do you have on there. And then you have to ask, well, what is your detection threshold? Because you have this sea of GFP molecules floating around. And you have to have enough polymerases that the concentration of GFP locally is high enough that you stick above the C, that you can actually see it. Okay? And so that's around three polymerases. And so starting at like 100, 150 GFP molecules condensed here, I can see it. Okay? It turns also out that the binding efficiency is not 100%. So if you have a cassette of 24 loops, you only bind like 17 plus minus 2 or so. Yeah, 
Yeah, so when the polymerase falls off, um, the whole mRNA that's elongating falls off of the polymerase as well and then gets shoved out of the nucleus. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So this piece of mRNA is the natural piece that the fly wants to make that will encode for the future protein that gives you this green pattern. Yeah? No, no, no. So this, this stem loop DNA was developed in a bacterium. Like GFP, it was developed in a, in a jellyfish, and I used, and I just put it in a fly. Okay? And so in the same way, that couple of stem loop system plus protein was developed in the bacteria, and I went into the bacteria, cloned the sequences out, and put it in two different flies. One fly, I put the stem loops. In the other fly, I put the, the, the protein that will bind the stem loops. That one I put in the mother. That one I put in the father. I mix them together, and they make this. Why did I do that? Because I want to measure the transcription activity. I want to know how many polymerases at any given time during development are on that particular gene. And so now I can go in and ask, what is the intensity level of these spots? And what's on my y-axis here, I can turn, it says right now, arbitrary units, because I haven't told you yet about a different method that I need in order to turn arbitrary units into numbers of polymerases that are actively working away. But this is the GFP signal, right? Because the, the stem loop is for binding a protein that I fuse to a GFP. See, this is the, the yellow, the, the, in black you have the stem loop, in yellow you have the protein that binds the stem loop, and I fuse that to a GFP. And that dimer of protein plus GFP that's floating around in the, in the cytoplasm. And as soon as there is a stem loop appearing, one of those proteins is going to bind to the stem loop, actually two. Yeah? Still don't seem convinced by what the heck I'm doing here. What, what's, what's lacking? What I know is that we have a, a big code, and in fact, they have an mRNA polymerase. Yeah. Which under DNA can make the mRNA. Yes. So and I trick that mRNA, that polymerase, to not just make the normal mRNA, but to have that normal mRNA with a cassette, with a pocket lamp kind of hanging out there. Oh. I trick it. So this is. That's what I'm saying. Yesterday, my slight modification to development was death. Today, my slight modification to development is that I put these weird stem loops in the system, which are unnatural. So ye yesterday, I looked at the natural system, but a dead one. And so if you do physics of living system and you do it on death, that's kind of a, a contradiction. But nevertheless, you get something out of it. And today, we are looking at life, but it's not the actual life that you see in nature because the fly couldn't care less of having a stem loop system yet. Okay? Yeah? Yes. So all of them glow, you mean in cytoplasm, they all glow, yes. But because I put, as we computed just before, hundreds of stem loops on this thing, you have many polymerases that run in parallel, right? And so that means there are now hundreds of GFP molecules all within the vicinity of a few nanometers. Um, well, you see it's a little green here, right? Let's call that background blur. All right, can I move on? So <laughs> the, this is a technique. We talk a lot about technique. The scientific point I wanted to make is that transcription in the development is very noisy. You see these births, et cetera, what people see in yeast and in bacteria, and so all is good. The only thing that isn't good, how do you go now from this noisy transcription to something as precise as we talked about yesterday? So for that, we developed a different method. 
And that method is based on a single molecule detection of mRNA molecules, again, in dead fly embryos. So in order to see single molecules, you need to kill the bugger in order to have enough you know, time with your collector to collect photons such that you have resolution of individual molecules. And so how did we do that? Well, we used something called in situ hybridization. In situ hybridization is where you take, you have a little piece of DNA that will find, that will bind to a piece of mRNA in your embryo. Okay? And so we take a little piece of DNA that is 20 nucleotides long, and we put a little glow on that. Whatever, something that glows fluorescence if I shine light on it. And then we take many of these 20 mers that have been pre attached to fluorophores, we take many of them and all and tile the DNA, the RNA that we want to visualize this with. And so now I have many 20 mers on my mRNA, and again, that's the same trick then with the MS2 stem loops. By that means, I put a lot of fluorophores on the same mRNA, and not just a lot of, but actually a known amount. And so the known amount is important because that means I can quantify. And so, sorry, this thing just advances at will. Anyways, if you do this, and you do the same measurement that we just did before, you can just look at individual nuclei. They have to transcription sites. They're very bright because there are many polymerases. Each polymerase has an unfinished piece of mRNA. All of these unfinished pieces of mRNA will bind, will be tiled by the 20 mers that have a fluorophore on them. And if you take the intensity in all of the nuclei and plot them as a function of egg lengths, you see that the intensity of these nascent transcription sites, that's where they're sold, they're nascent, they're just native DNA, RNA, you see that they're all over the place. Okay, very noisy. And you see it's a very sharp transition when you go beyond the boundary. Okay, all of them stop at like 0.05 egg lengths. Sorry, 0.5 egg lengths. All right? You can quantify that noise and, uh, by just looking at the mean over the standard, the standard deviation over the mean, and it's roughly 50%, again, which is something people see in yeast or in bacteria, nothing special about transcription in development. Now, how do you get rid of it? Well, first of all, each nucleus doesn't have just one site. Here, I'll show you the noise on individual transcription sites. Each nucleus has at least two because they're diploids. They have a site from the mother and a site from the father. But it turns out that the fly embryo is so fast that DNA segregates immediately for the next cell cycle. And so you have four spots. You have, sister, you have two alleles, and each allele has already its sister chromatids ready for the next cell cycle. That means there are four spots that are making the same mRNA. That means, if you get your statistics right, the noise should drop down by a factor of two if you average over the nuclei, and that's roughly what you see. Okay? One over square root of four is one over two, which is what you see here. But now, I also told you yesterday that we are living in a world where nuclei share cytoplasm with all other nuclei. There are no cell walls, or you just replace wall, cell boundaries. And so mRNAs can freely diffuse. And so there's naturally spatial averaging going on because an mRNA that's produced by this nucleus can go towards its neighboring nuclei. And we have measured that the mRNAs at that stage are also very, very long-lived, like an hour. So there's both spatial and temporal averaging going on. And by the time you look at, you measure now cytoplasmic numbers of single molecules of mRNA as a function of egg lengths, you see that your noise goes down to something of the order of 8%. So here I have now absolute numbers of mRNA, roughly 600, and it drops down to zero when you cross that boundary. And the noise here is something of the order of 8%. And yesterday I told you at the protein level you have something of the order of, of 10%, which we had measured earlier with antibody stainings. And so the step from here to here, I don't need to explain anything. And that 10% in protein corresponds to 1% in space. Okay, so. You don't need anything fancy for transcription here. All you need really is um, physics, physical processes like spatial and temporal averaging that help you to reduce the noise from 50 
all the way to, to your 10%, which is what you need in development to be precise. Yes? In the third column, in this one here? No, in this one here, I just look at columns around nuclei and count single molecules. Yeah, I look at the column around the nucleus, but not the nucleus itself, just at the cytoplasm around the nucleus, and I count. Okay. All right. So the, I just wanted to show you those two techniques because I'm going to need them and show you in the same token, development transcription is noisy, but in the fly embryo, there's a very simple mechanism that helps you to reduce that noise. Pardon? Did the professor of the error, uh, transcriptional, every transcriptional error with the cytoplasm incurred a viability set a limit for a minimum limit? Well, it sets a limit, yeah, it sets a minimum limit to how much spatial averaging do you need. Yes. Exactly, precisely. It's a number for the yes, because how many, how many neighbors of nuclei do you need to diffuse in order to get to that noise level? And it turns out the number is one. And which is very plausible, right? You have an MRNA, you make your nucleus, you make an MRNA, well, you don't keep it all to yourself, right? It naturally will diffuse at least to your to the neighboring shell. Right? And we have shown that that is in fact the case. And we have also shown that just purely temporal averaging is not enough. So you need you need a little bit more, and that little bit more is spatial average. Okay. All right. So yeah. There at least what? You mean there are at least two transcription sites? Yes, there are. Yeah. Yeah, right. So each spot, each dot was a single nucleus or a single transcription site. I do. In fact, the two intensities are completely decorrelated. There's not even correlation within the nuclear environment. So, intensities coming from one nuclear might be correlated. There is some extrinsic component of the noise that is correlated, yeah, because you know the fluctuations around are the same. But if you look at the nominal values, they are decorrelated within a within individual nuclei. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, no, uh, let's talk about this later, okay? Well, certain noises are, others aren't. <laughs> so it's a little more complicated. But some, yeah, some, the transcription noise is, is larger. And actually you can see over time how it, how it comes down. And we use this to actually also stage embryos because these embryos that we use the hybridization protocol, they're very fussy and it's much harder to stage them in time. Maybe we can talk about this later. So anyway, so um, we have these two nice methods now to um, probe transcription in the embryo. And um, that leads you to recognize that the embryo lends itself perfectly to use it as a laboratory to study transcription. Because Transcription is ubiquitous. It's you know the same in in yeast, in bacteria, in flies, and humans. But this system here lends itself really nicely to probe things because you have optical access. You have a setup that's extremely reproducible. So if you work with with single cells, it's very hard from day to day to always get your culture the same way, etc. In this case, the mother does it for you. And you not only measure in a single nucleus, a single transcription site, but you have kind of a high throughput imaging pipeline there because you can measure whatever, 500 or 
6,000 nuclei at once. Okay, so it's a very powerful system to study transcription. And the setup is extremely re reproducible, like you know, what you would want if you want to do quantitative studies. Okay? And so um, here on the left side, I'll show you again um, the live version um, with you know, the molecules floating around and binding to the transcription sites. And on the right, I show you a stack of a fixed embryo where you can see in blue the nuclei. In yellow, you see individual molecules of mRNA. And in, at some point, I think there should be very bright yellow inside of the nuclei, which are the transcription sites. Uh, here they are, you see. These are, of course, only on a few, st on a few slices of your stack. <clears throat> so what we can do with this now is to um, probe transcription at different levels. So you can probe transcription at the level of the promoter. So you can ask about you know, how noisy are things, right? transcription factors binding the promoter, and then instructing the polymer, polymerase binding on the, on the promoter and transcribing. And this is how you know, physicists or mathematicians have been thinking about transcription for ages. You have a promoter, bacterial system, transcription factors bind there, and we need to understand what's the output given that you have a certain input. But it turns out that in, um, in metazoans, so everything that is more than one cell, the places where transcription factors bind to instruct whether to make or not a gene, and the promoter, where the polymerase eventually binds, they are disjoint. I think I alluded to that yesterday. And so that means that there's a sequence of DNA that's 200 to 1,000 base pairs long. It's called an enhancer. Ken talked about these guys. Where many transcription, a cocktail of transcription factor can bind that can be away from the promoter and somehow still instructs the promoter to accept or not polymerases. Okay? So it's a can be a, a thousand base pairs, a lot, so there can be a lot of information from different transcription factors can be integrated at a single enhancer. Okay? That's in metazoans. But now, to increase even further the complexity, it turns out that in higher order metazoans, you have many enhancers that can instruct the same promoter at the same time in the same cell to transcribe or not. And so they kind of have to interact with each other, and we know nothing about any of this. Okay? So we know little about how actually do things work at the, even at the promoter level, but there are some models that, 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 we, that help us. Um, we, know, um, we know even less, if you look at an entire, uh, in, an entire enhancers, you have, in these enhancers you have many, many binding sites. And even if you have an enhancer that has six binding sites for the same protein and you permute them around, you still don't understand what's going on. Okay, so there's a lot to learn on these guys. And then if you even go further, if you have multiple enhancers, it becomes even more tricky to understand how do now multiple enhancers talk to the promoter. And you know, the complexity is just much larger. Okay. But at each of these levels, we can now go in and use co reporter constructs, both in the live and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the fixed setup, measure and then test models. Okay. And I could give you an entire lecture about this today, but I won't because uh, we're doing something. We have started to bring in yet another angle to this, to this uh, transcription, which we started three years ago, and we haven't really published anything on it, but I'm very excited about it, and I want to talk about this today. So we have a few papers on these things. Um, we don't understand much. They are just observations, correlative things. The models aren't really tight, etc. So I'm, it's still a work in progress. But the new stuff has to do with the fact that there are multiple enhancers, and that we recently learned from the ENCODE project that there are 10 to 40 enhancers in mammalian systems that can all interact with the same promoter in the same cell at the same time. It's gigantic, right? Or 
in another extreme, you have one enhancer that can interact with hundreds of promoters in your nose, like when your nose is made for the different receptors for different molecules of chemicals that you can, that you can smell. So in both cases, you have a huge amount of complexity just by the fact that you have one guy interacting with multiple others. But of course, how does this happen? Well, we have to now spread out um, these enhancers all over your genome, right? And it, people have shown that up, you can have an enhancer that's a million base pairs away from a promoter, and it's still able to instruct that promoter to do something or, or not. And that brings us to linking transcriptional activity in a nucleus with understanding the underlying polymer physics of the DNA or of chromatin. Okay, and so there's a whole new perspective that we have to take into account because all of this DNA is crumbled somewhere in the nuclei and somehow, nevertheless, these enhancers have to find their target. They could be very close, and we have no idea, because it's very, very hard to measure, because it's very small. Those nuclei, they are, whatever, 10 microns at most in size. In many systems, they are 3 microns in size, and your imaging resolution is uh, almost nothing. Right? It's like a third of that, a sixth of that, so very hard to see. I mean, the, I assume that being some genomic and code process, probably, you just know that this thing is happening. Yeah, so, so this, this, this number here, this number, this number here, yeah. That is, I just, I made that up. I mean, I didn't make it up. I used ENCODE. They tell you how many genes. They tell you how many enhancers. I took take, take one divided by the other, and I get this. So that's not rocket science. Right, On average, know. that's what it is. But we know but that there are individual promoters that have at least 10 enhancers, and that we know from functional assays. Right, but, but that's, that's in the mouse. Right, but you don't know that how, how many of those are functional. Well, you can take them and, you know, and test, right? Right, no, but this is what I was trying to ask, I guess. It's like, how many enhancers does a promoter talk at a given time? That we don't know. Okay. We have no idea. We have no idea. We also we don't know, for instance, if all of these enhancers loop or crumble the DNA such that you have your promoter, and then there's 10 enhancers piling up around it, and there's, we have no idea. Okay. And so the best measurements that are made so far on that question, what structure of the nucleus is concerned, right? we, we're going into the question of structure. There's the question of structure, how do you fold or pack the DNA in your nuclei? Because if you look at the bacterium and you explode it, the DNA come, is all over the place. You have like two meters of, of DNA that you have to smush into um, one cubic micron. And it's seemingly ordered, which is quite astounding, right? And the best uh, information we have so far, there's two ways. One way is you take this fish approach that I showed you. And you tag with two different colors, two different spaces in the, in, the, in the genome. And then you measure the distance. But of course, this is in dead tissue. And so you need to do this a lot of times to get a mean and you get a standard deviation. And actually, if you do this, you see that as a function of distance, your average distance between the DNA in micrometers, so this here is transferring micrometers into base pairs, lies on a, on a line. It's at least it's. There is some structure there that you can work with. It's not completely random. You could have this stuff all over the place, right? And so here you have one micron. And here you have your imaging resolution. And now you can try to see if it's live imaging, you can do anything with this. Because our goal is to look at this live. Because we want to see the dynamics of these enhancers, how they interact with a single promoter. Okay, so we want to tag a bunch of individual enhancers with different colors. And then we have our promoter tagged with this MS2 stem loop system. And so we can see how do these enhancers interact with the stem loop system and the correlation of spatial interactions with how much 
activity do you see? Okay, so that's the kind of the grand goal of what we're trying to achieve. And hopefully the data will lead us to models that tell us something of the underlying transcription dynamics, but at the same time of the underlying dynamics of movements of DNA and hence the polymer physics of DNA, the structure of the DNA. Okay? And so this is all from fixed tissue. So each data point here is a mean but with a huge standard deviation because they come from an ensemble. That's one way to get this kind of data. And the other, on the other extreme end, what people do, they take, they take <clears throat> nuclei and they cross-link everything together. Okay, so you take formaldehyde with a chemical, I think, is it formaldehyde or whatever. They take some inorganic chemical that uh, when two pieces of DNA are nearby, it cross-links them. Okay, and if you do this with enough nuclei, there's, and there's, there's now tricks where you can see where are these cross-links. Okay, and so people then build a probability matrix of chromosomes or even the entire genome of what is the probability that two pieces of the genome are close by because they have the statistics, etc. But it's a very, very rough method, right? It's based on statistics only. It's based on smushing cells. You don't have any dynamics. And most importantly, you don't have any functional biological relevance because you don't know if there's a crosslink, if that's meaningful or not for biology. Okay, this just gives you somehow the architecture of, the, of, the, of your genome. Okay? And so what we would like to bring to the table here is the dynamics so you can actually see whether interactions are meaningful or not. You can see how do multiple enhancers interact with the same promoter, etc. And you can see how you link that then to the activity of that promoter. Is the premise kind of okay? Or is this, was this too much? As long as I don't show any GFP, you don't ask me questions. All right, so um, as I said, uh, the uh, optical limit with the best microscopy that you can find nowadays is roughly down here at something 220 nanometer, which is already quite good. Um, the hope is to reduce this. Well, and so if you do this, we build such a thing. And if you do this, you notice now in your movies that you see the four spots and you see the chromosomes much nicer. Okay, so here you see the sister chromatids, which we couldn't resolve previously. So before, when I told you, well, here's a transcription trace, I actually lied to you because this was not one transcription spot, but it was two. And so already that makes it more difficult to model this stuff. But now we can actually resolve individual transcription sites because we have a segregation of the, a separation of the, of the sister chromatids. So that's at least in the right direction with the microscopy. Um, but then, of course, you can combine this with, you know, some super resolution techniques that I'm not going to go too much into and hopefully get to something of the order of you know, 40, 50 nanometers or so. Now it turns out that endogenous enhancer promoter distances in the fly, the system that I like to work with, they are around here, yeah, in KB. What is it, like 30, 20, 30 KB or so. That's the longest that you can find in the fly. Um, and so, but because I want to do this in the fly, we needed to resort to something else. And so to test if this entire approach has any legs, to test how our microscopy works, we designed a synthetic system that lets us you know, make progress, maybe understand already something about the polymer physics, even if the distances are slightly longer. Okay, and so I have the system that I want to introduce you to now is at roughly 142 KB. Okay, and I use a trick in order to make this work. All right, so far so good. So we, well, this is this is the, this is now the beginning of the talk. <laughs> this all this other stuff was introduction. So um, what we're doing is we're placing us at the locus in the DN, in our in the DNA of this gene called Eve, which makes nicely seven stripes. We have seen it yesterday. We use the same thing over and over and over and over, just for different things. So here's Eve. Here are the enhancers of Eve, and it turns out. And so they are very close. Yeah? These enhancers, all of the enhancers of Eve are within 20 KB, hopeless for my imaging. 
By the way, everything I'm showing you today is with regular microscopes, with like confocal microscopes. You can all do this at home. You don't need to build a fancy lattice light sheet. Or, this is just the, the guy who developed this is a developmental biologist, and he used confocal. Okay, and so there's they're going to be there's going to be an upgrade when we have the better microscopy. But I'm just going to show you all the stuff that you can already just do with a confocal. So resolving 20 kb is hopeless with a confocal, and so we need to use a trick. And the trick is that it turns out that at this locus, just downstream of the enhancers, there's a little DNA element that functions as a tether. And it has the property that when you take it and you throw it somewhere else in the genome, that thing that's somewhere else in the genome will bind back to its counterpart. Okay? And so that's whatever, like 20 base pairs or something. It's called an, an insulator, a boundary element, doesn't really matter. It's a, for our purpose here, it's a tether. Okay? And it has the biological function, at least in this system, to block any enhancers that are downstream of it from access to the promoter. That's why it's called a boundary in, uh, element or an insulator. All right? For our purpose, for now, it's just glue. I have a piece of DNA that's at the endogenous locus of Eve. I have a piece of DNA that I throw somewhere else in the genome, and they want to glue to each other. They like each other. And so, yeah? In this particular case, how were the enhancers uh, discovered? By mutagenesis? How these enhancers were discovered? Yeah. Yeah, by mutagenesis. Long time ago. Levine and company. Um, all right, so we put this a copy of this 142 KB downstream of its counterpart and fused a little promoter to it, okay? But no enhancers. Actually, this promoter here, I wrote write lux -Z, but it's the same promoter than the Eve promoter, and lux -Z is just a, a little gene that's encoded here because I didn't want to have this be a fly gene that interferes with anything that I want to do. So this promoter here is the same promoter than this guy here, but it has no enhancers. And so if you do fish again, you can see sporadic activity of this promoter, but only within the pattern of Eve, which means that the even enhancers are able to recruit that promoter to transcribe. It also means that this is sporadic because it's not in all of them. So you know, if you think of looping back and forth, this can give you a stable and unstable state. And only in the few stochastic events that are stable, you actually see expression. Okay? So that tells us that we're kind of on the right track. We have a system that has some stochastic events that are over a distance of 142 KB and that can still be controlled by enhancers to be transcribed. Okay? By the way, if I replace this element here with, let's say, lambda DNA, which is DNA from a phage that lives in bacteria has nothing to do with the fly. So some really weird DNA for the fly. You don't see any of those spots. Okay, so you need this tethering element to bind here to bring this enhancer close to, sorry, this promoter close to these enhancers so that they can act. Okay. And so yeah, the model then is that something looping has to happen. And so now of course this is fixed, and we want a live version of this. How do you do this? Well, you use this MS2 stem loop system and use uh, CRISPR. Have you heard about this? So the genome editing. Anybody want me to go genome editing? So there's a way to basically go in the natural, in the natural fly, in the endogenous fly, and stick something in that fly's genome. And that's what we did with the stem loop cassette at the endogenous locus of Eve. And so what you see here is a live version of how Eve comes on. That's as live as it, as it can get, okay? Because you need to tag it somehow. And so you see the seven stripes here, and then the thing gastrulates, and the Eve still continues to be on. It's the same method that I just talked about before. Um, so that tags one locus, and now you need to tag the other locus. Well, it turns out there's an orthogonal system that's not based on MS2 stem loops, but it's based on so-called PP7 stem loops. And you can fuse them next to the LAC-Z gene, and now you see again there's sporadic activity of lux within the Eve stripes. 
Okay, so we have recapitulated the fixed system now in life. Okay? But that doesn't help us yet because we can't see anything. All we see is, okay, sometimes it's red and sometimes it isn't. Well, you could compute probabilities of how often that happens, and we do that later. But what you, what the first thing we would like to see, and that's something, that's a question that has been open since the 80s when enhancers were first discovered, whether physical proximity between an enhancer and a promoter are actually necessary in order for transcription events to happen. Okay? That's the first, that's actually the sole question really that I want to convince you today that we nailed. Okay, is physical proximity between an enhancer and a promoter necessary and the maintenance of that physical proximity for that matter in order for transcription to happen or is it sporadic enough that you don't need that? And so, but for this, I need now a third tag that allows me to see this locus here when it's not active because I only see the locus when it's active and I would like to see when it's searching, looping, and finally finding and going on. Okay? And so for this, we use, yet, we use a third system that we stole from bacteria. It's based on a sequence that's called PAR-S that binds a protein that's called PAR-B. That PAR-B protein we can fuse to GFP and label naked DNA if you want. Okay? So that's a sequence of whatever, 500 base pairs or so. It has a bunch of binding sites for these PAR-B proteins. We put this right next to the PP7 loops. And now you should see this, of course, in all of the nuclei because they have not, this has nothing to do with Eve, right? So you see in all nuclei now a green spot. You see in the striped nuclei a blue spot. And you see lag Z uh, activity sporadically in a few. Okay? So this thing here, to make that fly, took us three years. It's not easy. You need to figure out three different colors. There's very, if you look, there's very few live imaging with three colors. And that is because, you know, if you want to have quantitative specificity of your three colors, it's very hard to pull them enough apart to get it all genetically in the same system, et cetera. All right? Yeah. Pardon? The par S? Um, yeah, so good point. So all of the proteins, that goes back to what I said earlier, all of the fluorescent proteins, so this blue fluorescent protein, this red fluorescent protein, and this green fluorescent protein, all of these are ready in the mother to go. I load the mother up during all genesis, during those two and a half days. The mother puts all of these proteins, folds them, matures them in the embryo. So when I, the embryo gets out of the pipeline, of the, the production line, gets fertilized, boom, those are ready to go. And as soon as you see loops or uh, pieces of DNA that can attach, be attached to the protein, you'll see foci. Okay? Good point, yeah. And, and we need this, otherwise it, we would have these delays, right? All right, so now if you zoom in and look at, um, we look at a few nuclei, you see there's one here expressing and two are not. And if you take the distance between the blue and the green fluorescent protein, take the distance, then um, you see that if the one that is expressing is almost always lower than the two that are not expressing, so they're definitely closer together. This is now a live trace. You can do some statistics. So if you average over the traces, you see it goes down by roughly a factor of two if you are expressing this protein or not. And now this is in a this is for three nuclei, but as I said, in your individual in your single embryo, you have many nuclei in parallel. You can do high throughput imaging if you want. And if you average over now 66 loci, you see that the blue-green distance, if you have no red, if this is not on, is roughly at 750 nanometers. And if you are on, you're down to like 340 nanometers. Okay? And so... That's kind of a live version and live proof that in order for transcription to happen, you kind of need that proximi proximity. Does this correlate somehow with the oscillator like Like why should it be half, not zero? Why should it be what? Like half. Yeah, good point. Why, yeah, so that was my next point. Why is it not half? 
Any other question before I tell you why it's not half? <coughs> oh, sorry, why is it half and not zero? So um, this is a, um, a confocal microscope, right? And so I am limited in what I can actually image. OK? And so it, as a control experiment, what we did was to co-localize in a different fly now the green and the blue spot in a given fly. Sorry, on a given site. OK, I'll show you on actually on the next slide how this is done. And so you know physically your green and your red are glued together. They're on top of each other. You know that. And now you measure. And you measure a distance of 200 nanometer. So that means that that's the best I can do. Okay, my microscopy doesn't allow me to do any better than that. And so um, here's the control. I just want to show you how to do this. So here I'm looking at just one dimension. So you have x, y, and z. If I do 3D imaging, you have x, y, and z. Are you guys interested in a little imaging uh, how you control that you're not under? Okay. So you have x, y, and z, and here I just show you x, the x uh, axis. And I show you what is the x in blue minus the x in green that I measure. The x in the blue channel minus the x in the green channel. Okay? And you see it's fluctuating. And this here is in individual pixels. So it's very noisy. Well, noisy. It should be noisy because that's the search, right? The things are 142 KB apart. They should have quite a few pixels to search. Otherwise, I don't measure anything. And what you see is that there is a, there's a slight decay here. And if you, there's a fit. And um, that line, that white line, really should be zero. Because on average, that distance should be zero. If there's a random walk, that's what we should have. The reason why it's not zero is because there's chromatic aberration. The blue and the green, through your objective, they shoot at slightly different angles. And so you have to correct for that, especially if you're after nanometer resolution. And so the correction is as a function of x position in my image. So there's somewhere here where indeed we have 0, but then we overcompensate and we undercompensate. And, and, and so you have to then go back in and correct your data for that chromatic aberration. But this is, of course, for each embryo each time. And so I need to do something to not always have to do that control measurement. And so the first thing we did is we generated a fly, which I just uh, alluded to earlier, where we have, where we can see all three colors combined in one spot. So here I basically take an alteration of these MS2 and PP7 stem loops and give them two different colors. So I have, you know, I have 24 stem loops of PP7 and I have 24 stem loops of MS2, and I don't put them next to each other, but I interlace them. Okay? And I put a par S next to it as well, so to have, to have the third color. All right? And so now I know that all three colors are localized in one spot, and now the data looks like that. Okay? You see, still see that same slope that was taken on the same day under the same conditions. You still see that same slope. Um, but now it's, of course, much, much tighter, because all we're looking at now is measurement noise. And so then you ask, well, it's 200 nanometer. Can, can't, you not, can't you do better? Can't you just sit there, make your things brighter, and reduce those 200? Why, why, why 200 nanometers? What are they coming from? Well, for this, then, you do the third experiment, and you now you take tetraspec beads, beads that have three colors. Beads, they don't move, right? Beads are fixed. They're just sitting there in some resin. And so the difference between what we see here in the beads and what we see here comes from movement because my confocal is slow. It takes stacks from time point to time point. And while it's taking that stack, or even while it's taking a single image, those spots are moving around. This is like random walk. It's KT movement, right? It's fast, much faster than the second, multiple second resolution that my microscopy has. OK? So this is really the imaging resolution that we have, the imaging power that we have with you know, the kind of setup we have. 
It depends on the power. It depends on how, what the, the quantum yield of your, your fluorophores, et cetera. This one here tells us how much, of, how much movement do we have. But note that all three slopes are the same. And so I can use the internal slope of my measurement each time to correct for chromatic aberration. And call this here my measurement error, and that corresponded to the offset from zero that you saw on the previous slide. Is that okay or too much? You want more? Or shall we move on? So this was for one embryo. Now, of course, I can do this with many embryos. And so here, each box is kind of an individual embryo. And um, you see that your distribution, so what I'm, and what I'm showing you on the y-axis, is the root mean square distance. So I take my trace, my two, my enhancer and my promoter, they're dingling around, OK, over time. They have a, in a, a spatial separation in 3D. I take that spatial separation and average over time. You take the Euclidean distance and take the root, and then you get something that's measured in nanometers. Okay? And you see it's kind of bimodal. And it turns out that all the times that we see activity of the reporter, they are in the lower mode of your bimodal distribution. Well, there's one outlier, but it's good to have one outlier, right? So did you call a less than, sorry, I missed something. When you call it the red ones, are they expanded at close but are not expressing? You're right, so yes, very good basis, observation. Are they on the way to express? Well, that's, uh, the rest of my talk is about those guys. <laughs> not exactly, but almost. All right, and so, um, because we have so much data, we have 2,500 loci here, you can actually extract a histogram. And um, it's a bimodal distribution. You see a big bump that corresponds to the search space of your two tethering elements. Most of the time, that's what's going on. And you see a small bump that corresponds to when these two guys are tethered. And you see an even smaller bump of when, in the tethered case, you get activity. Okay? So it seems like there's a two-step process. At first, these two tethering elements find each other. And once they've found each other, there's still a search for the promoter that is now somehow hanging out here. Right? It's fused right next to the tethering element. It's hanging out here. And it has to find the enhancers. Because this is, as I said, 20 KB. And so that's what you see here. And so I told you before, optically, we have absolutely no access to those 22 KB. It's hopeless. But now, with enough statistics, I'll show you that I do have access to actually understand something even about the endogenous Eve locus. And that's, that's in fact, what the rest of the talk is about. Yes, absolutely. I, got, I get back to that a little bit in the, in the end. Yes, there's right now no dynamics. This is the average trace in my 30-minute time window that I observe. Okay. How many what? Two. In each, on each chromosome, on each second chromosome, of which you have two, there are two DT elements. Well, I, but... To be honest with you, your question really was, is there competition between different DT elements? And the answer is yes, but we don't have access to it. Pardon? I thought there would be many. Yes, there are others. They are not the same DTE, but there's another one actually on this side here, which is continuously bound to that guy. So the entire Eve locus, those 20 KB, is already a big loop. But we kind of gloss over that for now, <laughs> because we we didn't take that into account so far, OK? It does not seem to interfere with the possibility of this guy talking here. OK? Yeah? yeah I, I must have missed this. But uh, in the slide before, you had shown that the, the, the resolution was 200 nanometers. Yeah. I 
So the mean, the peak that I gave you was the peak of this guy. And you see there's actually a little difference, right, between this peak and that peak. Yeah. And yeah. It might be that there's that in this case here we just didn't use the chromatic aberration correction. That this is the raw data or something. But it's a good observation. I'll I'll ask someone. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> the answer I just gave you was just uh, maybe that's the answer. All right. Um, good observation here, because the 300. I, but I'll show you in future slides. 340 is the one. Um, but it is true. Uh, so, anyways, and so you see, there's a certain um, percentage of transcription events, and of all the tethered guys, you have two thirds that are actually active. Now, um, we, did a, we did a few controls. If you, um, so this is the same data again. If you um, replace this guy with lambda DNA, you don't get the second bump. And if you replace this guy with the DNA tethering element, but invert it, then you get the second bump, but you don't get any red. Because now, because this guy is inverted, when it lands here, there's an orientation of how these two guys like to bind. When it lands here, the Lux Z promoter is going to be on this side. And so it has no access to the enhancers. Okay? And so that's kind of why we know that the element that's here that likes to bind to this guy doesn't really interfere with our system or with what we want to do with our system. Okay? All right, so um, again, the power of the fly embryo is that now we can, here I show you all transcription sites that I, that I see in my embryo. Okay? But the power of the fly embryo is that I have a, an imaging system where I can look and I can identify individual stripes. And I can now split this histogram up into individual stripes. Okay, so if you look at the, um, if you look at individual stripes, you see again the same kind of bimodal histogram. Okay, and then you can ask, well, what is the? So here is in 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 yellow you see stripe five, in red you see stripe four, and in blue you see stripe three. And you see that the fraction of active Lux Z expressing nuclei drops down. Okay, it's highest in five and lowest in three. That is essentially the difference between um, between the um, what, I, what we what we saw, we saw in, in your in your little bump here, right? There is a there is a part of the bump that is not active, and that goes down. And so what we saw in the previous slide was the average all of, of all of this. And now I've kind of resolved this in individual stripes. And the reason why this is the case is because the stripes are actually ordered along the, the leaf locus such that the stripe, the, the, such that stripe 5 is closest to the tethered Lux Z promoter. Then comes stripe 4 and 6. And then comes stripe 3 and 7. And stripe 2 we don't measure because it's too far out here, it's for another, for another experiment. All right? And so we can be a little bit more quantitative about that and um, ask what is the distance between the enhancer and the promoter for the different stripes? Because we can measure the distances, right? We have a measurement power of 200 nanometer, and these distances are different. And so here, Alessandro, I have your answer. If you continue to pay attention. <laughs> um, basically, the 340 that I mentioned before is just stripe 5. Stripe 4 and 6 are at 380, and stripe uh, 3 and 7 are at 400. And so what I showed you before was the mixture of all of these. OK? And maybe there's still a discrepancy, and that might be chromatic aberration, but this is partially certainly the answer. 
okay? If you resolve individual stripes, you see a difference. And so you see that these are further away than these guys, all right? Now, you can measure that same distance when, this, when the red is on. This wasn't the case when red is off. If you measure the same distance when red is on, you see that now they collapse down. They all come closer to each other. Actually, these guys come all the way to the, to the, to the same level than stripe 5. So there's a, a loop that will loop out between here. These guys, they don't make it all the way. They make it a little bit, and we, don't know, and we, don't, we, we really don't understand why. But right now, the hand wavy answer is because these guys are upstream and those guys are downstream of the promoter and maybe there's something else about the topology that we don't understand and that we don't have access to. Okay? But nevertheless, in each case, you have a tightening of the locus in cases where you are actually actively transcribing. Again, more power to the fact that you need the dam enhancer to be closed or in con connectivity with the dam promoter in order to have dam polymerases giving you transcriptional output. Okay, and uh, here again is the control. When you invert things, then things are, of course, not on, but you get more or less the same numbers. You actually get even a little bit less here, and this is because now this is on the other side, and we even have access a little bit to that. But you know, the error bars are large, and so I don't want to go too much into this. And finally, if you plot again this engagement probability that I had on the previous slide, as a function now of enhancer promoter distance in the case that the red is off, so these distances here, you see that you have a nice decaying curve. Note that it's a linear decaying curve because this is, in a way, the contact probability, right? Given as a function of distance, it's decaying. And so in the last slide, if I get there, um, I will try to link this to polymer physics, and that's really in an infancy state. Questions? All right. So the next thing you can do is you also have access to the endogenous Eve intensity. Right? In all of these stripes, that's how we know where to look. We have Eve activity, right? And so now you can ask, well, what's going on with Eve activity? If that same promoter also wants to, sorry, if that same enhancer in that stripe, whatever, five, also wants to activate Lux Z, suddenly you have now two promoters that are hanging out and want access to that same enhancer. You can ask about how does that affect, or does it affect the endogenous activity of Eve? Okay? And so. that we see here. So what we're doing here is we're looking at the activity of endogenous Eve of the blue channel, yeah? The activity of the blue channel when in nuclei where there's no red activity and compare that to the Eve activity in nuclei where you have red activity. And you see that there is for stripe five a 25% reduction for stripe 4 and 6, a 17% reduction. And for stripe 3 and 7, whatever, a 10% reduction. OK, so there is some competition going on that this enhancer suddenly needs to interact with two promoters and can't really cope with it. He doesn't have the power, the potency to be able to do it as good as if the Lux Z wasn't, wouldn't be hanging out there. So that's a really nice quantitative measurement, right? I measured a 25% reduction in activity at our 2.5 of the embryo's development. Okay? It turns out that these Eve stripes, as I said yesterday, we can see a trace of them. These are, they are a blueprint, if you want, for structures in the adult fly. So the question is whether when you reduce activity of one Eve stripe, let's say, by 25%, can you see a phenotype in the adult? 
that would be quite astounding, right? You reduce the thing by 25% at our 2.5 of the MRS development. Well, and I wouldn't making it <laughs> such a big story as that we actually see, if you wouldn't see it. And so if you look very closely in wild type, these are the segments of the fly body. And um, you see that in this case here, you're missing an abdominal segment four. And in this case, you're missing an abdominal segment six. And they correspond to stripe five and stripe seven missing. Or not missing, but having a reduction. Okay. So this is quite astounding, right? You have a little bit less activity very early on. And you see an, an effect, a phenotypic effect of that quantitative reduction of uh, numbers of proteins that you have in, in the early embryos. Yeah, that's what we have, we have done. That. We did not do this in these. This is not done in the stem loop system, etc. This is done in an Eve heterozygote uh, with, without the stem loop system. So we basically, we only, all we did is we put in the, in the, in the uh, so this is not there, and this is not there. All we have is a promoter here, the Eve promoter with this element that we crisped this into this side. Okay. Okay, so coming back to your earlier point, all of this was, we gloss over time. You can also now look, of course, at the time traces of this Luxe here. And um, here are 219 of those time traces. The intensity should tell you how many polymerases you have currently working away. It's roughly a, this here is a 60 minute window, but you see that not all spots are on all the time, right? And so you can order these spots now by the time they're turning on or off. And so you see that these spots here, they all turn on and these spots here, they all turn off. And now what you can do is you can align those spots at the time when they turn on and call that zero. All of the spots you align at the time they turn on. You see that in the red channel. And then you can get the transcription dynamics of this spot going on. So here you see a spot going on and here you see a spot going off. See, this is much faster. This corresponds to spots that are actually coming out of mitosis. In Hunchback or in Eve, we see the same kind of dynamics, and this one is slightly slower. But remember, polymerases are also running off, right? So even when the activity goes out, when the signal comes, don't transcribe anymore, there's still polymerases that want to run off. But now what you can do is you can go in, because you have, you have ordered your traces at time at some arbitrary time t0, which wasn't arbitrary, but that was the time when the thing turns on or off, you can now look in the other channels and ask about the distance. And there you see that as long as the thing is off, the distance is far away, it gets closer and closer, and by the time it goes to 340 nanometer, Alessandro, we are turning on. And the same goes for turning off. And you note that in turning off, it seems to start already four minutes earlier. And you wonder, what is those four minutes? But you know how long your gene is. And we measured previously what the elongation rate of the polymerase is. And you divide one by the other, and you get something like 3.5 minutes. And so the fact that we see this a little bit earlier, we understand quantitatively why does this happen a little bit earlier. Okay? And so what this demonstrates is that not only do you need enhanced proximity, enhanced promoter proximity for transcription events to happen, you need stable enhanced promoter proximity because as soon as the thing goes away, transcription holds, at least in this locus. And so models like, you know, you have an epigen enhancers put an epigenetic mark there and then go away, but because the mark is there, you continue to transcribe, they're kind of refuted by those measurements. But again, this is in a special Eve locus and for now, we don't know anymore. Okay, so, um, what, I have five more minutes? Um, so, this distance here was completely arbitrary, right? I just 
why 142 kb? Well, because the thing happened to land there. Um, but nothing precludes us from inserting this cassette anywhere else on the second chromosome or even in the genome for that matter. And so we have a bunch of other lines. And we can now probe all of these numbers that I just throw, threw at you as a function of distance from the Eve locus. And that's really what you want if you want to do polymer physics. You want to know how do things change as a function of distance, et cetera, and, what, and that will then give you some understanding of the underlying DNA. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you just three movies for those three um, insertion sites. So one is the one that we already saw. Um, there's one that is much closer. Note that there are now more spots. And there's one that is much further away. Note that in this movie, I think you don't see a single spot. Okay? And so you can now ask, what is the number of spots as a function of distance? Or what's the probability of seeing a spot as a function of distance? And so here you see in a log log plot the looping probability, which is essentially just the number of red over the total number that we see as a function of genomic distance. And uh, you see a nice linear decay. Um, you can uh, go a step further and compute again the root mean square displacement, or actually the, the mean square distance. Let's plot the mean square distance as a function of genomic distance. And so here again, you see somehow the spots being on a line. This is for the case when they are not red. This is for the case when they are red. Okay, so this guy, these black, these blue guys here, are the distance between Eve MS2 blue and Pares green. In the case when they are not red, and this in the case when they are red. But of course, we know what the distance of this guy here is, right? We know that these guys here are still 18.5 kb apart from each other, and so we get for free another point that's at 18.5 kb, and it's the average of these guys. And you see that it very nicely falls on a straight line. Okay? And also note that this is the only data set where I don't put error bars, because I don't believe in a single one of those data points. This is just, you know, the first round of experiments, and we need more in order to really I mean, it goes in the right direction to do some physics interpretation, but uh, we need more. And so my, my last word hasn't been falling on this. So what do you do with this now? Um, well, you go and learn a bit about polymer physics, and I haven't learned so much about it yet. So there's a very nice book by De Gen, which I'm reading. And um, you can view the DNA essentially as an uh, um, elastic polymer that can be modeled by a random walk. So let's say you pack two pieces of DNA. There's two spots. And these two spots, they have a random walk. It's called a worm-like chain model. And within that model, you can explain many, many things about polymers in nature. Not just, you know, mostly it has been applied to inert polymers, but it has also been applied to DNA in vivo. Uh, in vitro, and here we are now for the first time in a position to be able to apply that to DNA in vivo. Okay, and so what you have to consider there is that if you want to ask about the looping probability, there's, you need to essentially look at the, the free energy function, and what prevents you from looping is a tug of war between your bending energy, your elastic energy, and your entropy, okay? And so with those considerations within the worm-like chain model, you can show, and I'm not going to go through this in detail right now, that first of all, a straight line makes sense. But then you can go further and ask, what is the slope of that straight line? And there, yeah, and there now you have different variants of your model, and you can, you know, try to understand something about the compaction of DNA given those variants of this model. Okay, and so that's what we are after. But again, I'm not going to go much deeper into this because there's no error bars on my, on my data points. And so you can do something similar 
also for the um, mean square displacement, sorry, the, um, uh, the mean square distance, um, where you can show that within the framework of those models, that distance is proportional to, linearly proportional to the number of, of, um, of base pairs that separate two spots. And it's also proportional to the um, persistence length of your DNA. And it's proportional to the packing fraction. And so from the slope of this guy here, you now get then access to both the persistence length and the packing fraction of, your, of the relevant pieces of DNA that you want to look at. Because we know the persistence length of naked DNA in vitro. People can measure this. In fact, here it is. So here's a bacterium that has exploded and the DNA is all over the place. And you zoom in and you see there's little errors here. And that error corresponds to roughly 50 nanometer, which corresponds to the persistence length of naked DNA in vitro. However, in our case, what we are looking at is not naked DNA, but we are looking at highly ordered DNA. First of all, there are nucleosomes, so there are little pieces of histone around which the DNA is, is, is wrapped twice. And so you see here those nuclei, it is an EM picture, where you see those little balls of nucleotides. And so that certainly changes the rigidity of your DNA polymer. And moreover, there's models where even this might be compacted further into something that's of the order of 30 nanometers or so. And so all of these models can then be, can be tested by this data and taking appropriate values for this persistent length and the, um, and the packing fraction, or actually extracting the persistent length and the packing fraction. All right? OK, I'm, I'm done. Um, I don't need to. So we are now here. So we have done this. We are now here, where we are trying to now really understand quantitatively the underlying dynamics of DNA and how that affects transcription. Um, but then eventually, we are, of course, interested in endogenous and the promoter interaction. So we are taking really not this synthetic construct where we have a DNA tethering element as a helper in order to increase our statistics, but we want to see this as auto-tethering elements. And so that's what's currently going on. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>